Hello everyone, I'm Marta, the Programming Manager here at YPFP New York, and I'd like to thank you for attending our webinar. Today we will be presenting The Future World Order by Dr. Maha Aziz. Dr. Maha Hosein Aziz is a professor, author, and cartoonist focused on global risk and prediction in NYU's Masters of International Relations program. She is also a visiting fellow at the London School for Economics Institute of Global Affairs. Her first book, Future World Order, won two global awards and was a top 50 Amazon bestseller in the ideology section. 15% of profits from this book go to her brother's memorial fund for Syrian refugee youth in Jordan's Za'atari camp via charity, uh, peace and sport. Its sequel, The COVID-19 Effect, is out in late summer 2020 and 50% of the profits will go to the WHO's COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. Her 2016 political comic, The Global Kid, won five awards, all profits go to charity, and is being adapted into a political comic book for adults and a VR slash AR storybook for kids. She is a Jordanian-born Pakistani who grew up in, Middle e in the Middle East, in Jordan and Saudi Arabia, in the Southeast Asia, in Singapore and Malaysia, in Europe, in the United Kingdom and Greece, and in the United States. And she is a social scientist trained at Brown, Columbia, and the London School of Economics. Before we begin, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. First, we encourage you to ask questions. To do so, please send them to us using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer all of your questions during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or if we run out of time, your question will be answered after the webcast via email. If you'd like a copy of today's presentation, please email me at martamiller at ypfp.org. I'll put that in the, in the chat. Now, thank you once again for joining us, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Aziz. Um, one moment. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Sounds good. Okay. Great. Um, yes, I've been having some technical difficulties today, so it's, it's really a, a pleasure uh, to connect with all of you. I'm uh, calling you from London, where I've been working the last few months. Um, and uh, during the pandemic and uh, keeping an eye on my parents as well. I've been teaching online and uh, working on the sequel to my first book, Future World Order, which I'll talk about today. And um, so I, I also, I just wanna say that I know this is a sensitive time for all of us. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time to, to listen to what I have to, what I have to say. Uh, my work is really, as, as you can see in the, the next slide, uh, my work really is about making sense of the world. I focus on global risk. What are the threats to our stability? What could go wrong? And I've been doing that uh, on and off since 2012, based at NYU as a professor in the MA International Relations Program. And more recently, as I mentioned, I wrote this book, Future World Order, about how uh, how we are faced with a world of global risk and how it will deepen in the 2020s. And uh, as, as Marta mentioned, I also drew a comic book, which I'll quickly I'll shamelessly plug as well. <laughs> it's called The Global Kid. It teaches kids about global risk and 100% um, of the sales go to that same charity, Peace and Sport, that uh, Marta mentioned as well. Um, in my field, the the, uh, the goal is really to understand what makes countries tick, what could go wrong, and now we're seeing and 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 having doing having done this for so many years, I started to realize that the risks of countries in one part of the world in one region were actually comparable to the risks, the threats to stability in other parts of the world, whether it was democratic or non-democratic, whether it was an emerging market or developed economy it seemed as though there was there were certain trends that were replicating uh, in, in all countries in all parts of the world and that that led to my uh, more recent focus on global risk um, i wanted to take this opportunity today to take some ideas from my first book future world order which is available on amazon um, and my up the upcoming sequel which is called the covid19 effect uh, on our future world order 
and 50% of the profits from this upcoming sequel will be going to the WHO. Well, for obvious reasons, right? We're, we're in the middle of a pandemic and I thought uh, this could be my contribution. I, I do want to also mention that uh, my students and I at NYU, every year we generate a top 10 list of global risks for the coming year. And uh, we do this in collaboration with a crowdsource consultancy called Wikistrat. I would certainly encourage you to look it up. It's on Medium. Uh, on, on my Medium uh, blog site, we've identified five global risks and five countries to watch. Of course, this was done in January before the, the, uh, the onset of the pandemic, but a lot of those risks are still relevant. They were just on hold while we've been dealing with the current situation. Uh, in my work, I've beyond working with students, I, I actually have consulted on this topic with governments, with corporates, and um, there are qualitative approaches, there are quantitative approaches, but um, uh, uh, my approach is largely qualitative, looking at open source information online and global trends. And of course, there are critics. There are people who say that, wait a minute, the predictions we make are are really not necessarily adding a lot of value uh, because nobody holds us accountable when we're wrong. And in fact, they've even go gone so far as to say that human beings who spend their lives more of forecasters than dart throwing monkeys. So I would certainly challenge you to test that theory. But uh, at the very least, I wanted to share my view on the world today and where we're headed. Uh, next slide. So the way I view the world through the lens of global risk, if I reflect on the last decade before COVID-19, the two, 2010s, it's pretty clear that there have been some significant disruptions uh, in four key areas. And I, and I view the world through a state and society lens. Uh, it would be insufficient to simply look at the world through the lens of government. You have to look within society as well. And if you do that, it's clear that we are faced with a global identity crisis um, in the sense that we are, uh, we're seeing challenges. We've seen challenges to certain norms in our geopolitics, our politics, our economy, and our society. And, and that's what I want to take uh, uh, discuss a little bit. Uh, for the next couple of minutes before we look at even the effect of COVID-19. So in a pre-COVID-19 world, uh, it was already clear that we were at a crossroads geopolitically, okay? Uh, even before President Trump took office in the US a few years ago, we were already uh, questioning whether the US still led the world, whether the US was still the sole superpower of the world. And I think uh, in the last few years, given the um, the anti-globalist uh, uh, approach of the current White House, uh, it's clear that the uh, that there is not a U.S.-led international system that we had in the early years after the Cold War. And I, I think that's been the biggest concern of the last few years: who's in charge? If the U.S. does not have that traditional role. Uh, in in leading the international community, in promoting democracy, in promoting human rights, who's in charge? And uh, in my book, I go into a little bit of detail. Uh, I, I consider the options. Is the is the future of the world order simply Asian? If you look at the rising powers in that region, not just in terms of China, but other markets as well. Or is the world simply going to be defined by the US-China competition? Um, and, and I'll plug uh, a new book that has just come out by uh, a mentor of mine, Kishore Mabubani. It's called Has China Won? And it goes, as the title <laughs> suggests, uh, he, he, he does feel that China has, has overtaken uh, the U.S. in recent years. So that's the first aspect of our global identity crisis. We don't know who's in charge of the world, and that has dominated the last decade. Second, we have had a... We've been at a crossroads politically. If you reflect on the years since the Arab Spring began, the reality is in every type of political system, whether it's been democratic, non-democratic, or something in between, it's been very clear that uh, citizens are not happy with the 
the status quo. They're, they haven't been happy with um, with their leaders, with their with certain policies, and um, what I what I consider in the book is that perhaps democracy is not necessarily still the best system. Uh, and there are uh, quite a few studies. One I'll uh, uh, mention is by Yasha Monk. He's written a book about this as well. Uh, and in his research, he's seen that a Western, uh, in the Western environment in the US and across Europe, millennials didn't seem to be as uh, enthusiastic about democracy as, in, as, that, as was the case with previous generations. And if we see citizens pushing back um, in all political contexts, including democracies, is it still the best system as we assumed it was going to be at the end of the Cold War when Fukuyama declared um, the end of history, that democracy was going to be the end of our political development? Um, so that's a question that, that we've been struggling with over the last decade as well. What could be next? What political system could be next? And in the book, again, I, I touch on how we've we've kind of in 2019, we were sort of in the midst of a global spring, where the it, you could have labeled it the year of the of the street protests because it was remarkable how many protests were happening in all parts of the world in all political systems. Uh, citizens armed with tech were simply angry and felt that there must be a better system or some alternative uh, ahead. So, so that would be the second aspect of our global identity crisis or global risk. Thirdly, I think that it's been clear for a while that globalization has had uh, a lot of problems. There has been a, since 1999, there were citizen led movements around the world uh, protesting about the rising inequality that they felt was arising from globalization. And the truth is in the last few years, particularly here in Europe and, and I guess now in the US, there's there is this economic alternative in terms of this idea of economic nationalism and populism. And uh, again, there's no clear answer as to how to overcome this challenge to globalization. But on top of that, what we've seen in the last few years pre-COVID-19 is that we've also we've also started to realize that we're at a crossroads in terms of our employment. Who are we in relation to our work? Because we, are, we were already headed for massive unemployment due to automation, due to the onset of, of automation in many industries. And what, what people like uh, uh, economist Guy Standing uh, have argued and what I've also built on in my book is that we've seen in the last 10 years in particular uh, the emergence of a new social class of precariats. These are people who have fallen behind because they've fallen through the cracks in terms of globalization. They haven't benefited. Uh, perhaps some of them were struggling because of the global youth unemployment crisis of, of recent years. And as a result, they have not been able to sustain or build a occupational identity. And it, it, in, a, in, a, in a certain way, it's created a, it, it's contributed to this mental health crisis where there's no job security for this emerging social class. Again, this is pre-COVID-19. Um, and and a, the, this is another key component of our global identity crisis. Who are we in relation to our work? Who will we be as uh, robots, uh, as we know, will take away quite a few jobs? 40% uh, of jobs, according to some studies, in the next decade. Lastly, I want to touch on the, uh, the social aspect of our global identity crisis that, again, relates to this idea of global risk. And I think we've seen in, in the last decade that, well, we're confused about who we are in relation to the other, because there's just been this wave of hate, of xenophobia, that seems to have dominated the narrative in some context, in some political context, or in certain countries where uh, hate groups have uh, a, a stronger presence. And it's led to this larger question that we are, that we need to answer for ourselves. Are we globalists or are we nationalists? Do we care about the other? 
And in the book, uh, in my book, Future World Order, I, I try to explain that uh, in the, after the Cold War, it seemed as though we had this sense of shared global values. Again, a US-led international world order, uh, a world order that had, you know, had the legitimacy to dictate global values that we should strive for democracy and human rights. But that hasn't been the case for a while. And and again, it it's not just happening at the level of, uh, you know, within society, it's happening at the level of the state. Again, I ask you, are we globalists or are we nationalists? Uh, do we care about the other? All of this represents our global identity crisis, that we're at a crossroads geopolitically, we're at a crossroads politically, economically, and socially. And, and that's what I predicted in my book, Future World Order will deepen in the 2020s. And that would be the case even if there's a change in leadership in the US, we shouldn't assume that everything will snap back into a place, that the world will suddenly go back to being a US-led world order, or that we will have no debate about the value of democracy um, or globalization, and that we will suddenly have shared global values. It's not that simple. And I think uh, particularly those of you who will be working in foreign policy for the rest of your careers, uh, these are the types of questions that you're going to have to uh, tackle. Uh, you're working, you'll be, we exist in a world that has this global identity crisis in these areas. And um, I don't feel that enough world leaders are tackling uh, specifically the, the society aspect in terms of our, our who we are and what our values are. I think that's that seems to be put to the ha, has been sort of put to the side. Um, and um, and I, I would challenge you as as young professionals in foreign policy to really reflect on that and see where you can fit in. Again, of course, this is in a pre COVID-19 world. Now, let's consider the next slide. What's next? the current COVID-19 dynamic and where we may be headed, headed next. Okay. Um, as you can imagine, and I guess I've been rather bleak in, in what I've, um, what I've been predicting, but it, it's, it, it's important for you to be aware of it and make your judgments. What I would say is that the COVID-19 pandemic has um, it's definitely deepened these existing global risks that make up our global identity crisis. But there's something has shifted. If, if we look first at the level of the state and we look at the world um, through the lens of geopolitics, I think it's safe to say that the pandemic has reminded us that the traditional US-led multilateral world order is over. Okay. Um, and uh, it, it has been encouraging at different points to hear that the G20 has met, the G7 have met virtually. And I, I, I think there's still value in that. On the other hand, uh, there does feel as though there is a lack of consensus or a lack of faith in the current leadership and in these organizations that are supposed to guide us through these global challenges. And what I have observed so far and what I think will uh, define the coming months and uh, certainly the coming year 20 into 2021 and probably beyond is that we've witnessed this, uh, this new form of bilateralism. So maybe the US led multilateralism has weakened, uh, but there is this unusual form of COVID-19 bilateralism that has that has taken shape and it's not yet clear how this will reshape the world order. And, and what I mean by COVID-19 bilateralism is that what we've seen is that individual countries have engaged with other, other states uh, in COVID-19 diplomacy, where they've, uh, whether it's been China or Turkey or South Korea or Cuba, they have used this opportunity of the pandemic to renew or build new ties with other countries by sending medical support, uh, whether it's been masks or um, or act or even sending doctors. And and there has been, of course, as you know, there's been so much coverage about China filling the global uh, 
uh, leadership, uh, filling the global policeman, the global role in this. But as I said, Turkey, South Korea, these countries have also been very aggressive. What will be the long term effect of these of these new bilateral relationships on the world order going into 2021? It's unclear and 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 that at this stage feels as though it could lead to more instability, the lack of consensus on or clarity on how these relationships will evolve. Uh, I think it's also worth mentioning that their COVID-19 bilateralism is not just state to state. What's been interesting for me to witness as a social scientist is that you see uh, non-state actors also directly engaging with governments to provide COVID-19 support and, and another type of COVID-19 uh, bilateralism. Uh, if you think, for instance, of tech billionaires, whether it's, of course, Bill Gates, but Jack Ma, Adrian Chang, even Elon Musk, directly offering certain world leaders in recent months medical support. It, it will be interesting to see how these um, influencers, political influencers who are non-state actors, who are not uh, uh, you know, part of governments, what that will mean for the changing nature of power and, and the world order uh, as we get deeper into this year and into 2021. So this is what we need to think about. And in, in my, um, and, and of course, the, and right now there's a lot of de debate about vaccine nationalism. Um, uh, you know, if one country gets the vaccine and right now there's coverage about how China potentially has it and, and um, uh, you know, if one country gets it and is it going to share it with the rest of the world when we don't necessarily have a global community of leaders who are talking directly about this on an even playing field, it could lead to uh, a rise in instability if there's a competition over the vaccine and that we'll have to wait and see how this COVID-19 diplomacy or bilateralism and vaccine nationalism will reshape our world order in the coming year. Um, in my book, I try to put a positive spin about how we can look ahead. We know what the parameters are now. We know what the situation is geopolitically and where we could be headed. Um, and maybe it may be time to reflect on new types of, um, you know, uh, advisory bodies. If the G7, G20 have lost legitimacy uh, in the current environment, you know, uh, maybe it's time to think of a new type of body maybe one which has leaders who are who have beaten beaten the virus. Um, if you look empirically, and there's been coverage about this as well, a couple of, quite a few of the countries that have beaten the virus happen to be led by women. So maybe we need a new G7-like body with female leaders who have beaten the virus and let them guide us on how we should navigate this COVID-19 world order going forward. Um, this is what we need to think about, but, uh, Obviously, right now, the immediate concern is uh, slowing down the virus and uh, um, and uh, thinking about the vaccine and how that will play out. Uh, but but this is how I how I see the world geopolitically uh, and 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 also how we might be able to get to a more positive outcome with a new advisory body. Second, uh, as I already mentioned, we've had citizens challenging all political systems in the 2010s for various reasons where governments have fallen short of citizen expectation. Well, COVID-19 has reminded us of this, uh, although maybe for a brief period, at least I know I was hanging on the word of President Trump, hanging on the word of uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson here in the UK, hoping they would just figure it out, that we could just navigate this sad situation um, and come out of it stronger. Right now, it does not feel that way, frankly. And we've already seen, uh, even during the lockdown and, and, and ongoing, we've seen protests where citizens have protested um, uh, the, the, the specific lockdown, but also related policies that governments have introduced. It's exacerbated the existing tension between citizen and government that we didn't have a handle on even before the pandemic. And that's what we need to reflect on. That's what your generation has to reflect on in the coming years. Could it be time for a new social contract between citizen and government in a COVID-19 world order? Is that what we need? Um, 
and and again, I would say, is it time to consider more female leaders in governments and politics, given that their performance um, in certain countries uh, with their COVID-19 response? Uh, lastly, I would say that, you know, in my book, I touch on this idea in both my books. I talk about this idea that um, we've seen certain millionaires and billionaires who are activists coming to our rescue um, during the pandemic and even before the pandemic happened, trying to fill the policy gap where they felt governments governments were falling short. Um, and, you know, I think that is very um, it could potentially be very dangerous to think about a non state actor having so much influence on politics, but uh, I think longer term, we need to think about, could there be a more defined role for those uh, millionaires and billionaires of the world who seem to be. Uh, uh, filling that policy gap, offering specific advice and. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic right now, uh, I think it was in, uh, uh, just this last week, there was a, um, uh, a group that emerged uh, called Millionaires for Humanity. And they have said, they have pledged publicly uh, that they want governments to tax them more because they feel that uh, that's what their role should be to help navigate the, uh, the pandemic and the related economic crisis. And of course, we've seen, uh, as I mentioned earlier, all these billionaires try to fill that gap as well uh, in terms of medical support and uh, financial support. Could there be a more defined role for these sorts of non-state actors? I think that's the kind of question we will need to debate in the coming years. Thirdly, um, the economy, right? Uh, COVID-19 is, well, we all know the, the reality. Uh, it's pushing us into economists say pushing us into uh, a global depression. We'll have to wait and see. But if you look at, uh, at different country case studies, there are attempts by governments to um, introduce certain relief packages um, it's to support uh, individuals who've lost their jobs, to support small businesses during this rough period, during the lockdown and in the coming months. But the reality is, and even some finance finance ministers have articulated this, that we can't help everybody. They've they've literally said this. There will be people who fall through the cracks who won't necessarily be able to uh, find new employment or go back to their pre COVID-19 job, uh, given the the uh, the situation and the effect on business. We also know that in some countries there's a hunger crisis brewing as a result of the um of the of the pandemic and what i try to argue in my upcoming book is that we're naturally going to see more protests we're going to see more people emerge who are precariats who as i mentioned earlier have uh have sort of fallen through the cracks and are not necessarily able to find their footing in a pandemic economy or a post-pandemic economy that they've lost their occupational identity and uh, it could contribute to a larger mental health crisis. And I think it's encouraging that there has been a lot of coverage and speeches and you know quotes by uh, public figures, whether it's I mean uh, whether it's Prince Harry and and Meghan to uh, uh, to Prime Minister uh, Johnson to other world leaders as well in organizations uh, that they're they're talking about the mental health crisis that that we're all to a certain extent going through because of the pandemic, but I think what will uh, what will be the game changer is uh, longer term if we have that support for people who have fallen through uh, the economic, uh, the, the um, uh, fallen through the cracks in this weakened economic state. And, and what I try to argue in my next in my second book, the COVID-19 effect. Is whether this is a time to reset our economies to reset our moral economy to redefine that um, that sensitive relationship between citizen and government in terms of what we expect uh, what is the minimum subsistence that we can you know what's the minimum level that we can uh, subsist with and i think unless we have those discussions it's going to be um, it's going to be complicated to uh, to see this uh, to see this uh, unfold. I also think, uh, as I already mentioned, there's a, you know, 
of course, there, there needs to be more women in politics and in government, but I think there also needs to be more focus on giving opportunity to women economically, women driven economies. We've been talking about it for years and um, the GDP, the global GDP will go up significantly if there are more opportunities in all contexts for women to have these opportunities. So maybe this will, the silver lining of the pandemic could be that we have these discussions about geopolitics, about politics, about the economy and what's working and what isn't. Um, and lastly, I wanted to talk about um, this, the social aspect. If we look within society, again, sadly, we have seen that COVID-19 has led to more xenophobia, okay, um, and hate in a world that was already pretty fractured, as I discussed earlier. Um, yes, the, the pandemic sort of united us initially because we have all, we have all sort of had the shared goal that we want to live, we want to beat the virus, but in, in some contexts, it's definitely exacerbated existing tensions. There are examples um, um, in uh, places like India and Malaysia, where there's been coronavirus related misinformation campaigns that led to attacks on Muslims and Rohingya refugees. We've also seen many cases of a backlash against East Asians globally because of the perceived origins of the virus. And there's definitely been a resurgence in um, anti-migrant, uh, xenophobic um, rhetoric from certain political parties in places like France and Spain. I, I, one, of the, one of the questions I always raise when I talk about this issue of identity and the hate that has spread in recent years is where has been the counter narrative uh, to such hate? That's where we have failed. Uh, we have heard people like UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres talk about ending hate speech, and that's been positive, but most world leaders have not tackled this issue, uh, particularly during the pandemic. Um, I think, though, the silver lining that we've witnessed is uh, with respect to the global citizen response to the George Floyd, pro uh, George Floyd movement, uh, his death led to protests against hate in over 40 countries and in all states in the U.S. And I, frankly, in the middle of the pandemic, is remarkable. And maybe that is the silver lining of, the, of what we've been experiencing, where despite this health crisis, you see citizens coming to the streets and uh, risking, you know, risking their health and possibly their lives to share their, um, to share their perspective and remind us that we do have a global community, that we do have at least one shared value uh, in terms of being against hate and, and racism, except that uh, it's also shown, though, that this is something that has, um, uh, well, it's led by citizens, but it's not necessarily something that's reflected by our world leaders. And I think going forward, what we'll need to see is if we can devise new shared global values for a COVID-19 world and um, and even to have, you know, empathy campaigns, virtual empathy campaigns led by minorities and women. And these are the sorts of ideas that we will, well, that your generation, uh, members of the YPFP will have to reflect on in your, in your careers. And um, yeah, 